Hello, and welcome to the Wild Wonder Podcast, where we seek to democratize and demystify holistic wellness practices with leading practitioners in the field. I'm Kristen Yorka, your host, and I'm joined today by Rita Johnston. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Kristen. I'm excited. Um, of course. Rita is a trauma-informed life coach and educator. Uh, Rita, what is trauma-informed? We're seeing it everywhere now. It seems to be the latest catchphrase. It's a buzzword, right? Everyone's <laughs> trauma-informed. Um, <clears throat> Trauma informed is is a, a practitioner or someone who really understands the effects that trauma has on on us and on our experiences. So it's someone who understands the six principles of trauma informed care. It's someone who understands how to how to not re traumatize, how trauma lives within us and. And so they're able to really work with you on identifying, understanding, supporting you as a whole person okay. who has experienced trauma. Like all of us. Yeah. To some degree. <laughs> yes. Yes. So it's, uh, again, it's it's become a, a buzzword. And I, I like to be very clear that it's not about reading a book and on on you know trauma and now you're trauma informed there you know it, it can be really really scary sometimes for people to relive their trauma so really understanding um really having the the expertise the 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 practice of what what even is trauma right you know and how does that even show up can we speak to that what is trauma how do you define trauma uh, trauma, well, this it's real or perceived, and this perceived part, um, I think sometimes is missing in the conversation of mm. trauma. It's a real or perceived threat, situation, circumstance that we experience, and it leaves these lasting adverse effects on how we're able to function in the world, on our physical self, emotional relationships, spirituality, all of these different aspects of who we are. I, th I think that's the first time I heard someone bring up the perceived part because, and I think it's important. So I'd like to highlight it because I always speak to the fact that like me and my brother were 16 months apart, right? Um, he could experience something as a trauma that I didn't. Mm -hmm. And then now as adults, when we talk about it, he might be very upset by this thing that happened where in my mind, I'm like, but I, 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 I don't feel that anything happened in that instance, even though we both experienced the same, the same event. Thing. Yeah, but you didn't experience the right. same thing. You were in the same situation, but your experience of it somatically, you know, internally, mentally, how you, how your brain registered and processed the event was totally different. And that's why that perceived, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you think when you walk into a dark room and you see a shadow, you respond to that. Mm -hmm. There's a perception there of threat. And then you realize it was just your jacket. And so you're fine. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that is, that's why that is important because of how it's not just about the experience. It's about, you know, how are we processing? How mm -hmm. are we registering this experience? What's, what's our brain taking in? What memories is this same sensation attached mm -hmm. to in the past and how are we bringing these past stories into what's happening now? Absolutely. Yeah. You made me just think of, um, and maybe this is for all women, um, particularly black women in the black community and marginalized communities in general. My uh, husband would say, I'm going for a walk and it'll be 10 o'clock at night. And I'm like, are you crazy? There is no way I'm going for a walk at 10 o'clock at night. And this is a constant argument in my house. He's like, why not? That's ridiculous. We live in a perfectly fine neighborhood. I'm like, I'm not walking out that door at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> it's not happening. Yeah, because we have different lived experiences. I have a similar story. My, my husband, when he would get in my car, would cut off the dome light. And so when I get in the car, the car is not lit when I open it. Oh. I'm just now getting into a dark car. And so I had to have the conversation of, I don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. when I can't see into my car, especially at night. And he's like, I never even thought of that. 
because we have different lived experiences right. and, and the world views us different too, right. you know? So and then we take in all of the isms, you know, sexism and, and racism and genderism, and that has an effect on us as well. And then, you know, we're talking about trauma. So mm -hmm. that perception of threat, and then we can go into intergenerational trauma of, you know, what are we carrying with us and how do we, you know, how we respond to these situations and why we do, which is going to be different than someone else. So maybe let's go there. Let's try to define intergenerational trauma. Because um, I don't know that I'm very clear on intergenerational trauma. How would you define it? Uh, a lot of times it may be called ancestral trauma or mm -hmm. um, generational trauma. And it's trauma that's passed down through generations. It's not necessarily yours or an experience that you had, but you're still living the effects of it. I can give you a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. Science yeah. is really, I'm really fascinated by this, <laughs> uh, starting to learn more about epigenetics oh, and yeah. how our our DNA shifts and changes and how that gets passed down through the womb. It's, it's incredibly fascinating. Um, are you familiar with Dr. Joy, Joy DeGruy? Yes, but I haven't read much of her work. Uh, um, I really enjoy her work. Yes. And um, she gave an example when we're talking about intergenerational trauma and she talks a lot about, um, I think it's called post-traumatic slave disorders, which she calls it, but she oh, gives wow. this example. And um, I think it sort of helps put intergenerational trauma into context. And so the example is you have this enslaved woman and this enslaved man and um, someone, um, someone comes up and they're like, oh, you know, your son's doing a great job. And so the mother then starts to berate the son of no, you know, no, he's not, he's not great. He's stupid. He's an idiot. Mm -hmm. And so it's that response to the son to try to protect him. But mm -hmm. the son doesn't necessarily view it that way or carry that. He carries that differently. And so we do these, these things, mm -hmm. we have these experiences, these responses to to try to protect ourselves and our loved ones and our family. Right. And then it, you know, creates this, this herd and it changes how, how our children then respond into the world. And, and then they have to shift and navigate. And, and again, that all gets carried into our DNA and it shifts our perception. It shifts our brain and the way that we perceive experiences in the world. That I, I just wrote down her name again because I was like, I'm reading a book. I'm ordering it today. Um, yeah, the, yeah. The first time I came across intergenerational trauma, and it wasn't defined yet in that way, well, I believe was in the book Black Swan, which mm -hmm. was more about sociology. It, it compared um, the Cuban experience to uh, one part of the book, very small part, but it, it spoke to me. I was like, oh, this is it. This is epigenetics. This is intergenerational trauma, even though their words didn't exist yet. But they compared uh, our experience, our Cuban American experience to the French during their revolution and the French that later went to Canada. And the French um, mm -hmm. after the revolution would uh, close up all their curtains. And for generations, they would do that. So that, and maybe I'm speaking out of turn, and if anybody is French currently living in France, tell me if this is still true, that they they still will keep the curtains closed so that no one can see into their house and see how what their how many belongings they have and if they're upper class or middle class or lower class. And it's something my parents still do. It's something mm -hmm. I still do. I You come into my house, and I love open windows and everything, but... I notice that I close all the windows and doors mm -hmm. every in every room. Um, yeah, and it's not a conscious thing, right? It's it's not like I'm exactly. saying, oh, I don't want anybody to see inside of my house, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so it's that, and that's that's what I get to do with clients, and that's I love it so much. Is 
you know, identifying why are we doing these things? That looking at the patterns, the habits, the beliefs that we have and how we navigate the world and how did we learn that and and how does that sit in your body and and what are the thoughts that that come up around that? Right? That's encoded mm-hmm. in your in your DNA. You know, why? How? How did that get there? <laughs> Could, we we covered a little bit um, race and culture, but I'm, I want to go back a little bit and I want to think about some of these maybe uh, held in women, like these these trauma, almost trauma bonds held across women in society that maybe we all carry to a degree. Um, <clears throat> can you think of any of those or any clients that would be a good example of something we as women maybe all carry? Mm. I think one of the things that come the confidence, the mm. way that we as women, I see this a lot across the board and even experience it myself, the way that when we're navigating the world, how we make ourselves small, oh. the way that we second guess ourselves, the way that we give our power away to others, and it's not something, again, just this generation, it's something that has been nurtured and passed down through society mm-hmm. for generations and generations and generations. So just watching women navigate the world, watching them walk down the street, watching mm-hmm. them grocery shop and the way that we do that, we, the way that we carry that. I find that fascinating that it, it also, because we've been living in this patriarchal society around the world, I think it translates no matter what culture you grew up in, because to varying degrees, we all experience a, a patriarchal upbringing for generations. Um, that um, I was reading Glennon Doyle's book, Untamed. Have you read it? And she Not yet, not yet. That, I've heard it was so good. I, I think I read it in two days. I blew through that book. But she the part that really hit me, and I kept thinking of it on a run, it was the word selfless. That women are taught again and again throughout the generations to be selfless. And she says, mm-hmm. we're teaching women to have a loss of self as like the highest attribute or value you can hold. Yeah. Yeah. And then adding to that, so you said across the globe, which... Mm-hmm. Yes, right? So women across the world. And then let's add the different layers to that. Let's add different cultures and different races. Um, let's add, uh, let's not talk gender, gender issues, sexuality. Mm-hmm. Can't forget the LGBTQ2IA community. You know, when you start adding different layers of experiences, you know, you're adding layers of trauma. You're adding mm-hmm. layers of generational stuff so which how is, does that go, yeah, go ahead. which is reinforced in the world i was just thinking about um how even my grandmother's generation which isn't that far removed once a woman had a child it was like she was dead she would mm. wear in cuba she would wear a all black generally and sit on her porch her job was done wow and then so, so for someone carrying that and then to be reinforced in the wording of others that were raised in that same culture, even though on the outside, it looks like we have moved on, right? Yeah. But I still hear it in the way our community speaks to each other, right? The, yeah. the, once you have the child, they're like, oh, well, you don't count anymore. Or no, you have to do it for the child. It God forbid you say you're doing something just for yourself. You know, you don't count anymore. Yeah, guilt, shame, all of that. <laughs> and then and then the message I find it really interesting why we feel the need to be in other women's uteruses anyway. <laughs> um, but if you have one kid, why do you have one? And yeah. when are you going to have more? If you have two, are you done? If you have three, when are you? What are you doing here? When are you going to slow down? So it's it's the constant message that no matter what it is that you do, it's it's not the standard or it's not going to meet the standard. It's not good enough. Right? For anyone, yeah. Yeah. So going back to that question you asked about what you know, what's something 
in women across the board, it's that we are getting just flooded with all sorts of messages and we may not even realize mm -hmm. how they affect us. Right. And then added to that, our upbringing of being selfless and wanting to please. And then you have yeah. the perfect recipe for disaster. Absolutely. Absolutely. I made a post on Instagram yesterday about mm -hmm. boundaries and someone replied, uh, I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Getting ready for today. I wanted to be here and present. Mm -hmm. But I started to read it. And so my question was just, you know, what's let's talk about boundaries. And they're not actually bad. And, and we right. feel bad sometimes because of the messaging of you're not allowed to have boundaries or you're selfish for boundaries or I'm in control of your boundaries. And I mm -hmm. will tell you right all right. of this messaging around boundaries. But they're they're just messages. They let us know what's ours and what's not ours. And so someone, my question was, you know, what's keeping you from saying no? Mm -hmm. And someone made the comment about permission. And I thought, oh, that's so good. Mm -hmm. I see that all of the time, needing permission, mm -hmm. needing permission to, to just be, right. needing permission to say, this is not okay with me, needing permission to say, I need fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. especially as women yes. you know, we it's not something that that has really been cultivated in our society well do you think it's something we're trained to do not only to ask, like to ask for permission but it's almost like to make sure you're doing the right thing you know yes like, oh, even yes. though I, sometimes i don't do it outwardly i still think of it like oh should i ask my dad <laughs> i'm a grown woman you know <laughs> I am a grown woman. I I too, no. I'm like, oh, should I run this by my dad? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, and then catching that of like, oh, where did that come from? I do too. I've had to do a lot of work around that, mm -hmm. a lot of work around that. And yes, I think we are very to do that. Some of that has to do with different cultures, different expectations in mm -hmm. the family. Again, where do those come from? Um, you know. Some of those were survival things that we had to do that mm -hmm. we don't necessarily have to, but we're still carrying this this training, this tradition with us. Um, some of it, again, has to do with society. Some of it has to do with because we, because of our experiences, we've spent so much time giving our power away that we don't even, like you said, I didn't even realize I'm needing permission or asking asking for permission in this way. <laughs> right, as a grown woman. And I actually, I, I was speaking to a friend and I was I was speaking to her about boundaries and also asking her to ask for her own needs out loud, which um, she was having trouble with. But she said, which was brilliant in its truthfulness. And I think a lot of women think this and don't say this, but she says, if I ask for what I want, then I have to take responsibility for what happens next. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And she's like, I don't yeah. want to do that. And I was like, oh, you know. Yeah. It can be scary to realize how powerful we really are, that we do have power, that maybe our experiences and the life that we're living is because of choices that we made. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we do have more choice and we think we do, we just don't want to make it. Right. And I think, how does this, the idea of perfectionism in women come into play? Because I think, personally, I find it challenging to allow myself to fail. So if something feels so big that there's a 60% chance that I'm going to do it wrong, I have some qualms with doing it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Perfectionism is such a trauma response. I've, again, done a lot of personal work around this <laughs> of noticing, noticing. It's actually what led me into, into learning about somatic experiencing because my brain would be in one space. Mm -hmm. 
states where like I know my body is a completely different way that I don't want. And so mm-hmm. there's this conflict, this pull, and it feels so big and so overwhelming. And specifically around perfectionism, I would notice that same thing of here's this thing that I want to do. And why am what's going on in my chest? Why am I feeling mm-hmm. this way? What's going on in my gut? What what is this? So doing a lot of a lot of research and and work and training around perfectionism and and realizing the underlying messages that we've received, uh, recognizing some developmental childhood trauma in there that keeps us in these belief patterns or these habit patterns that then keep us from doing the thing because we're afraid to fail. We're afraid to make a mistake. We don't want to get shamed or rejected again. Mm -hmm. And then doing the work around that of so what would happen if you were rejected? You know, and and what are some of the other ways that you've you've been rejected or shamed or didn't meet expectations? And you know, how are you supported? Who is who is there for you? How did how did you carry that with you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, perfectionism, trauma. Because trauma. I think that on per- personally, when I think on perfectionism, perfectionism when I really meditate on it, my belief system is, which is illogical at best, is if I do everything perfectly, this, everyone will love me. Nobody Mm -hmm. can hate me. I will never be the villain if I just do everything perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. When I meditate and, and get to the root of mine, my perfectionism is if I do it right, then everything will be fine. Everyone will be okay. none of the bad stuff will happen because I've been able to prevent it, right? That sense of control. control. And then something like 2020 happens and and it kind of feels like the universe screwed us for a loss of a better word. I was like, I did everything right, right? I, Uh I did my meditations, I did my yoga, I built my business, I did all the things for everyone. And what, like, and this is the reward I get? It feels in complete conflict with the belief system. Mm -hmm. For so, so many people, 2020 was really, it's like the rug got pulled out from under us. And, you know, here's all your stuff. Let's address it. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's just look at all of the scary things that you've. Yeah. Been you froze for one second. Wait. Away from mm-hmm. trying to control and prevent. It's right here. You froze for me. Yeah. You okay, froze. Back. You froze for me for one second. Back. Can you repeat um, for what happened to people in 2020? You're saying that their stuff came up. Yeah, every, everyone's stuff came up. It's like here, you know, here's all the scary things that you've not been wanting to look at or address or you've been trying to control. Here it is. Let's look at it. For a whole year and maybe more. I really, <laughs> and what, what's funny, like if you're doing doing the work, right, you're either in trauma counseling, you're working with a coach or um, a psychologist, I, at least personally, I felt like, okay, I, I did it. I, I'm like there. All, even though I know that healing is a spiral and there's no like mountaintop, still there was, there was kind of a sense of accomplishment at the beginning of 2020. And then it was like I got pushed off the hill, you know? Yes. Yeah. I get across the board. So many people have. Um, I had an influx in 2020 mm-hmm. of of coaching clients and it was specifically around anxiety mm-hmm. and anxiety because there's no control. We have no idea, there's no end. We don't mm-hmm. have all of the information. So really having to sit in that uncomfortable feeling of there's nothing that I can do. Mm-hmm. There's no information. I don't. I really have no idea what tomorrow is going to bring. And, you know, our brains don't like that. Our brains Mm -hmm. want to be able to predict. So that a lot of people are carrying anxiousness around life has changed and we have no idea when we're going back in quotes, right? Mm -hmm. Um, 
And then there's been an influx in knowing that there's things to do and wanting to do things and having goals and having things, like things still need to be done, but that mm -hmm. motivation has gone. And so there's a lot of procrastination, a lot of just sitting and, and stagnant and not moving. And then frustration mm -hmm. from not moving and sitting down and I know what I need to do and I just can't get it done because my brain won't function. And mm -hmm. so those two things have shown up a lot, a lot this past year and really helping, like you're experiencing trauma, global trauma. Right. I, know I, keep, I know I keep saying trauma because yeah. it's so important. And I think that 2020 was really an eye-opening year for us to recognize how much we are all carrying with mm -hmm. us. Yeah. And we've been and then, carrying it. Yeah, and then seeing other, what was very apparent, I feel like we all, we're not only dealing with our own trauma, we're dealing with those around us. We're still living yeah. in community, right? Whether you live alone or with the family. And I felt like there was a split into kind of, if I could be very binary now, if I felt like there was a split into two groups, there was people that were dealing with their trauma and they, they went like the compassion route and saw like, okay, we're all in this together. We're all going to get through it. And then there was the group that did the, the spiritual bypassing, right? The spiritual bypassing. Like they decided that nothing is happening. They are fine. And took a more individualistic, like life is just going to keep going mm -hmm. uh, attitude. It felt, it, it shook me. I was like, how does that happen? How did two group, well, there's not only two groups, but to be general, two groups respond to this trauma in such completely different ways. Mm, I noticed a third group. Oh yeah. Kristen, I noticed a third group of people that weren't spiritually bypassing, but they weren't dealing with their stuff already. Mm -hmm. They weren't doing the work. And so they sort of got hit with this disorientation of mm -hmm. what's going on has this been going on? So it was, okay. it was, I guess it would be more of a shift into doing the work. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I think that there was a third group that really was kind of blindsided. Kind of, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I could see that too. Um, yeah, it's, it's, we'll see what all this brings, right. But um, I think it could only be good things. It was kind of like, um, in the tarot, the tower moment where you just get the tower gets struck by lightning and gets completely destroyed and you have no control of it. So you're just free falling, yeah. you know, <laughs> and you're grabbing onto yeah. the tools you can, but the only way is down, you know? Yeah. And it can feel really scary. And then that's when we resist mm -hmm. a lot of times, or we do all of these things to avoid the fall, the fall to avoid, mm -hmm um to avoid failing you know to try to try to regain control mm -hmm. brace ourselves we do all kinds of things all kinds of habits and patterns we revert back to these old coping mechanisms mm -hmm. and and survival strategies and we wonder why aren't they fitting anymore mm -hmm. you know because your experience right now is way right. different than it was when you know you were 10 or you were 16. yeah i i noticed that that was the most surprising for me that even with all this these tools all the work i've done over 20 years that my coping strategies my initial coping strategies are the same as when i was a child mm -hmm. which is run like <laughs> drop everything and run you know yeah <laughs> which is yeah. and it's funny that it, it i think i mean you're the trauma informed counselor but I, I think it'll always be there. It's something I'm always going to deal with. I don't think there's ever going to be a day where my initial response is going to be like, okay, just bolt, like this, just escape however you can. Maybe not. Maybe not. It's possible. And maybe not. And that's, that I think sometimes is what really frustrates people is they do, they have a response. That's and we have no control over it. It is automatic. You know, our bodies do what they need to do to get us to safety. And then mm -hmm. people get really 
angry or frustrated uh, with themselves on how they respond to stressful or hard or challenging situations. And so getting them to tune into what is your body trying to tell you instead of fighting with mm-hmm. yourself and fighting with your body and fighting with your thoughts, maybe they're cues, yeah. you know, maybe uh, let's tune into what, what, what are you noticing sensation wise? And then how, how do you know that? Right. Mm-hmm. Sometimes these are, it's that deep wisdom. You said mm-hmm. same responses when you were a kid. Mm-hmm. So you've had this for a while. So let's use it as a resource right. to help us through these challenging times instead of fighting with ourselves. Right. Um, and going back because we spoke on somatic experiencing, which I believe is what you're talking about. Can you can you describe what that would be to someone that um, doesn't know what we're talking about? Yeah, somatic experiencing is body-based trauma therapy. Uh, We are working with the activation in the nervous system. Uh, Whenever we are either chronically stressed, acutely stressed, traumatized, there's activation in our system. Mm -hmm. And so it's working with the person in order to, to build resilience and a baseline and and to not carry that with us constantly because it, you know, our body keeps score. It's constantly taking note of our experiences even before, you know, before our brains, our, our memories are online. Mm-hmm. You know, we have this deep reptilian centuries old within yeah. us. And so being able to tune into that, you know, when, when, like you said, Kristen, when, when you're in times of high stress, your first response is, I gotta get the heck out of here. <laughs> well, guess what? That's mine too. That's mine too, is like, ah. And so, you know, really tuning into that. And when we're talking about somatic experience, and it's noticing where where does that sit within the body? Where what are you experiencing? So, you know, we talked a little bit about the gut, mm-hmm. um, which for a lot of people, that's our that's our intuition or our knowing. So mm-hmm. when you get that sensation in your gut of, you know, and we label it as something doesn't feel right, mm-hmm. or we might label it as anxious, but stripping away the labels that we give things mm-hmm. and just noticing it feels tense, it feels tight just tuning into that wisdom. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what else are you noticing? I'm noticing um, tingling on my right side and my shoulder. And so really being able to tune in Mm -hmm. to how things are showing up for us. And then sometimes we need to slow it down. Sometimes we need to speed it up, but it's it's working with how, how we're holding stress, how we're holding anger, how we're holding depression, how we're holding sadness, how we're holding joy and happiness and love and grace. And, and, and if we, if we want to squash anger and, mm-hmm. and our frustration, then we're also squashing our joy and right. our, and the beauty. So, you know, really working with people with, with what are you holding? How do you hold it? How can we befriend it? Um, you know, how, how can we, how can you love you and be you in your wholeness, even that's when you don't like how it shows up? Yeah, that's it's radical compassion, right? Like to be able. Yeah. And I and I imagine yeah. it's it's a kind of Absolutely. relearning, right? Because, I mean, I work with very young children, um, and I see it all the time. At least in our culture, we're not showing our children or ourselves how to tune into our bodies and not only respect that, but um, give it some weight, right? Some importance. I I mean, you see it all the time. We, like kids in sports, they'll fall down and the kid will be saying, oh, but I feel it here. And they'll be like, no, no, you're fine, right? Or yeah. a kid will walk into the room and feel uncomfortable and the adults in the room will force the child to walk in and still say hi to everyone and or hug, hug. give someone so a hug yeah you know again let's invade your boundaries right. and not yeah and so what do we do we suppress that mm-hmm. 
it, that's how we learn. That's how we learn to suppress is I walk in a room and I feel uncomfortable. I need to just shove it down because I right. have to present. Right. I have to present. And so then we carry that with us as adults, you know, or I, I'm not allowed to have feelings in this moment. So I'm just going to shove them down and I'm not going to feel anything. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be happy. And so when this anger comes up, this frustration comes up, you know, shove it down. Don't deal with it. Whoa. It's still in there. Yeah. It's still, it's still in there. Yeah. It just might show up a different yeah. way. I always say what's repressed has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. What's repressed? Didn't go anywhere. Addressed. Yep. It's true. <laughs> I, I'm, I've, I think my most challenging emotion has always been anger because I think it wasn't allowed, right? And I think as a woman and culturally, it's just it wasn't allowed. So I've always had a difficult relationship with anger. And I think 2020 was my big uh, lesson, right? Like, no, you are angry. You are, there, there's no way around this. You are so angry. So you could either like go through it and make friends with it or use it, but you cannot. It, it's too big right now to be able to go around it. Oh, yeah. I was joking with a friend that maybe I will shift and and be an anger coach after 2020. <laughs> and <laughs> everyone is angry. And that's the thing is like, can we acknowledge and address this? We're freaking angry yeah. for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. I, across the board, everyone I saw, there's anger, anger, anger. And like you said, it's not allowed. It's mm -hmm. not allowed. But now it's bubbling to the surface and it needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And I think 2020 was a great year for that. You know, I am not on this bandwagon of how awful it was. Yeah, mm -hmm. it had crap moments, mm -hmm. but oh man, oh man, it was so needed. Yeah. It was so needed for the world and for us to address our stuff, mm -hmm. to look at it, to shift and change and to, you know, decide what we want and decide what we don't want. And yeah, it was hard. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah. sucks. I went through some stuff in 2020. I'm like, man, really? <laughs> really? I do. I never imagined like me of mm. all people have to go through this, you know, uh, but it was good as needed. Yeah. I think it, it also, I heard a, I was on a call with another coach and she said something that I've been trying to hold on to, which is you, not to me directly, she was speaking to a group, you all did some things in 2020 that you thought you would never be able to get through. Like at the beginning of 2020, if somebody said, you're going to go through this, you would have probably thought you'd die, crumble up and die. Mm -hmm. But you did that thing that was the scariest, hardest thing you thought you would never yeah. have to do. And you are yeah. here. And I was like, yes. So yeah. I'm holding on to that hope. Like as I walk into 2021, I'm like, that was the hardest thing I have ever had to do. Yeah, and see, right even now. that, <laughs> like I'm watching you, right? This is what I do. I'm tracking you. And as you're saying that, you are like, I see you in your power and you're you're probably thinking about the stuff that you had to go through. And you're mm -hmm. like, yeah, I did it. So again, like what is, you know, what does that standing in that power feel like? What is, when we recognize, man, I, I went through some stuff. I'm here. I did it. Yeah. Wow. When we start to acknowledge that and take that in, many of us don't live in that, that healing vortex. We live in the trauma vortex of all right. the crap. Right. And, you know, we can access that really easily. We can mm -hmm. access what it feels like to be in the yuck and everything's hard. And mm -hmm. uh, how do we access that healing vortex? Right. Is it, I was speaking to a friend yesterday, I did a tarot reading for it and I was like, step into that. I'm not saying like that stuff wasn't hard. I'm not saying yeah. that you deserved any of that. What I'm saying is celebrate yourself for what, for standing in your integrity and going through it mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. You know, and I think we need more of that. I think, especially when we're, we're in the trauma informed world there, we do speak a lot about trauma and it's so necessary, but then it leads us to here, right? The work leads us to here. And there might be another hill to climb. There definitely will be another hill to climb. But there's these mini 
<laughs> endless. But at, at the plateau, how about we celebrate the plateau? Like we made it here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you know what, Kristen? Some of us don't know how to celebrate. Right. Which is another another part of I think the work is we weren't taught how we weren't taught that we were ever good enough. So or that we can ever stop or that we've we've arrived or you know to just be. Mm -hmm. So even that in itself is like what does that look like to get to a plateau and recognize that we are instead of just constantly going, going, going. You know, what does that look like to celebrate ourselves and to give ourselves permission to do that? Right. I mean, I I mean it's been a lifelong learning process to be able to celebrate. You know, um, and it's validating to hear that I'm not the only one, even though I, you know, subconsciously yeah. I know that, but like subconsciously I don't. <laughs> yeah, 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 I get that. Like, like other people have trouble celebrating themselves. I, I don't think we talk about en enough about that because what we see on social media is people celebrating themselves all day. You know what I mean? <laughs> Like, look at this awesome thing I did and that, and I'm traveling here and there. And yeah, there. the visible. Yeah. Yeah, but that internal, are you internally able to sit with that? I was just working with a client last week of, you know, we were pendulating, going back and forth between, you know, we call it the trauma vortex and the healing vortex. Mm -hmm. So being able to expand, like I said, we tend to have a really good capacity to sit in the yuck. And mm -hmm. so being able to expand sitting in the good. And so this client says, I feel really good about myself and this feels uncomfortable. And I'm like, it does. Let's <laughs> just sit there. <laughs> like, you know, ah, just take that in. It's, take uh, that in. Years ago, I, I realized um, through my own work, I did while well, I was going through emotional release therapy, I realized that I had a really hard time accepting compliments, gifts, anything that felt like I was being celebrated, especially from the outside, I had a lot of trouble with, um, mm -hmm. to the point that I, if someone were to give me a gift, in my mind, I was already doing the math of how I could get something, do something bigger for them, mm -hmm. you know? So part yeah. of like my ability to celebrate myself was when somebody would compliment me or give me a gift, I would, I would say, thank you, which seems like <laughs> obvious. But for me, it was this like, gr it took a great effort to get there to be able to say just thank you. Or, or somebody says you look nice, or I like your dress. You're like, Oh, thanks. Instead of being like, Oh, I, it's, it's just I've had this for 20 years. And I, I got it um, from Goodwill. It's nothing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And noticing that. Yeah. Noticing that um, noticing the way that those patterns show up, you're so not alone. Many of us experience that. I do it too, and um, like the the thoughts that come in and and the sensations. Noticing when someone compliments me, all of a sudden I get really hot. Yeah. Right, all of a sudden uh, my chest starts to tighten, and so when we can tune into these things, uh, then we can we can make different choices, and we can change. And we can change some of these patterns and the and the ancestral stuff that we've been carrying with us. What's what's one way that maybe someone can do today or even immediately to be able to begin to step into their power, to be able to step out of this um, feeling of smallness and and really begin to expand? Hmm. I, can I give you a couple of things? Yeah, of course. So just more, more, more the better. Uh, awareness is is huge. Um, so whatever that looks like for you, some people are really great at journaling and they really enjoy it. So sitting down and journaling, uh, going through your day and and reflecting, reflecting on how did you respond, what could you have done different, what would you do different, uh, how how would you want to to look next time. So just sort of reflecting on how we are showing up so that we can I just start to identify patterns and make changes. Uh, something else we can do is, you know, I've been talking a lot about somatics. That's a big piece of my work. A big component is working with that nervous system, working with the sensations 
I always say that, you know, the best way to stop it is, is to catch it before it happens, right? Mm -hmm. The best way uh, as someone who, who deals with and, and manages depression, you know, I call, I call mine the abyss. <laughs> and so I hate when I spin in the abyss, it feels yuck, it's very dark and it's, it's not fun mm -hmm. to, to be depressed. So one of the best ways for me to manage my depression is to catch it before I slip into it. So somatics does the same thing. One of the best ways uh, to catch when we're feeling anxious or nervous is to is to catch it ahead of time. And how do we do that? By tuning into our bodies, tuning into tightness, or or when we feel numb, or when we our heart's racing, we feel activated. What's going on? And and what are some of the patterns? that you, you notice you have these same sensations in these other ways. Mm -hmm. So that's another way of two ways for you. One is just journaling and reflecting on, on how we show up. Which but I then two- I feel like a lot of not, a lot of people don't wanna do, you know, that yeah. slowing down and sitting. I, whenever I bring up meditation or journaling or any kind mm -hmm. of um, contemplative practice, I feel like the initial pushback you know, because yeah. Yeah. Right. when you sit, your stuff comes up, <laughs> Right. you know, your stuff comes up. So the moment many being busy can also be a survival mechanism or trauma response, mm -hmm. because if we're busy, we, we don't have to, to deal with all of the stuff that we've been shoving in. Um, I've been doing this work for nine years yeah. and, you know, stillness in some way. So whether that is journaling whether that is taking time to be aware of how we are experiencing things, whether that is you know, even dance. I love to dance. I have dance parties all the time. It can oh, be really me meditative. Yeah. Put music on and just lose yourself and and get out of your out of your brain mm -hmm. art. But really having an awareness of yourself. Having Going back to dance one second, I want to give out a shout out and maybe a recommendation to Gaga movement. Have you heard of it? No, tell me. Um, so in, there's an Israeli dance company and their choreographer and director developed this um, somatic form of dancing called Gaga. And he does it for the elderly in nursing homes. He does it with regular people. He does it with dancers. And it's the most fun. Um, without getting so much into it, it's kind of being able to listen to your body and then slowly letting it do what it wants to do within certain, um, like, con like constrained in a way, like, okay, you're going to do whatever you want, but you have to be looking left while your body goes right. You oh, know? me. <laughs> that sounds, I went to a, a, a static dancing oh, a yeah. little couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. so, which I loved and have been doing since it's where we were just in this large just turn music on and it was a couple of hours the music was always changing and you just whatever your body wanted to do it's listening mm -hmm. and moving no judgment sometimes you might catch eyes with someone and you might dance with them for a little bit and then you go off mm -hmm. and do your your own thing but yeah I, I love dancing because we get out of our mm -hmm. cognitive thinking mind and we drop into that wisdom. Art is the same thing. Mm -hmm. Going for a walk, being in nature, it really is about being in tune and, and listening and tuning in. And also giving yourself permission because I feel when I recommend to people you need some time or some contemplative practice, they immediately want to be told what to do. Well, give me the yoga sequence that's going to resolve. You know, I lost you, Kristen. Oh, can you hear me now? I can. Okay. So I was just saying, it's also a matter of permission. Um, like when I, when I have clients or students, they want me to give them what to do, right? They want to know what is the yoga sequence I can do every day. That's going to solve all my problems. <laughs> what they don't want to hear is I want you to listen and discover what it is that your body needs from you right now and move in that way. Yeah. 
Yeah, or maybe you get this a lot too, Kristen. Okay, I did my yoga check. Yeah. Do you get that a lot? Like, yeah. okay, tell me what to do. Okay, journal check. I did it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. set that and meditate check. I did yoga check. It's like mm, kind of, but you're still sort of missing a piece here. So let's right. slow this down. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, we've even uh, taught retreats and workshops where, well, I mean, at least it's my opinion that the most important part is the meditative part at the end or Shavasana or that we do all the, the stuff, right? All the decoration in order to get you to that place so that you can tune in and be comfortable enough to sit with yourself. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you the number of times that people just get up at that point and walk out. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I'm like, no, no, this was the point. This was the whole thing. <laughs> I, I can only imagine. Yeah, it really, I see it a lot. That's when, when we settle is when the things come up and they're uncomfortable. And how do we build capacity to be able to deal with the uncomfortableness that comes up? Because if we try to deal with it all at once, we might get flooded and mm -hmm. go into that freeze, go into that flight, go into that fight, sh mm -hmm. completely shut down, mm -hmm. completely not be able to function. So how can we slowly just like drip drip right. how do we access that and build and continue to grow in a it's safe kind of, way it's kind of like the other side of the coin to being able to sit in your celebration or what you call your sit in your in your healing right mm -hmm. it's kind of how can we sit on the other side too and be able to expand our ability to sit in discomfort yeah yeah and then how can we how can we go between both with ease versus mm -hmm. rigidity or mm -hmm. restraint or constricting ourselves of, oh, no, 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 bad stuff. Right. right? When we talk about the perfectionism is like, oh, no, 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 no. You know, right. well, how can we flow through that? Because we're doing that all day long anyway, mm -hmm. constantly. Um, you know, you're, you're a parent just like me. So, mm -hmm. you know, one minute your kid can be completely fine and go in the room and then they come out of the room 30 seconds later and it's a whole different environment. Mm -hmm. So working with people and yoga, you know, they may come in one way and then have a different, so we're just constantly up and down, up and down, back and forth all day long. So recognizing that, how that shows up for us, how that affects us, what do we need to be able mm -hmm. to take care of ourselves so that we can continue to support and take care of others. Mm. Now that you say that children are a great mirror for that because we expect ourselves. Well, we, I think most of us put an expectation on ourselves to always be upbeat and perfect and the one in control and at least on the outside. But if you watch children, they don't live like that. They, no. they, they flow through emotions. They're not, they're not stuck in stasis you know they're they're constantly flowing through those emotions and i think they're better able to do it than we are because they allow themselves to they give themselves permission to flow from one to the other they do they do and then they learn from us oh maybe maybe i shouldn't be this way right or or getting punished or or having love withdrawn or all of the things that happen yeah that, that you know we get out of that flow state Yes, children are excellent, excellent mirrors. So I took you on a, a long tangent because <laughs> I wanted to address how we don't do the things you, normally that you want us to do, which is to be able to sit in contemplation. And you gave some great um, advice about finding maybe it's art, maybe it's dance, maybe it's walking, um, journaling. And then what are some other things we could do to be able to like walk into and step fully into our power? Mm. Acknowledgement is huge. Acknowledgement. I think sometimes acknowledgement can be scary because then we think we have to do something about it. Okay. And that's like a whole nother piece. Maybe later down the road you can. Can we acknowledge what's going on mm -hmm. in order to step into our power? You know, saying this doesn't work for me. This feels uncomfortable. This mm -hmm. is not what I want. This is not what I need. And I, you, you touched on it earlier. Of sometimes when we acknowledge what we don't power back, and we have to then take responsibility and take action. Um, are you familiar with the book Nonviolent Communication, NBC? 
Yeah, I, so it's part of our training. Good. I really, yeah. really like that book. Yeah. Um, specifically because that language helps us start to be able to speak and ask for what we need. Mm -hmm. So whether we use it with others or use it with ourselves, but really just acknowledge, I actually have it here. I always keep it here mm -hmm. on my board because I try to use that <laughs> language, um, observations, feelings, needs, request. Mm -hmm. And so it really gives us this awareness of what's going on and what do I need? Mm -hmm. And whether or not you acknowledge it to someone else, just start acknowledging it to yourself to take your own power back. Could you repeat those again? Acknowledgement? Yeah, so observations, Observation. feelings, needs, and requests. So you know, Kristen, I I notice that you are looking at the time and I am feeling a little anxious because I know we have a time frame. <laughs> and so I'm needing to check in with you and see where we where we are with this because I know it's time to wrap down, right? Mm -hmm. so that just kind of how we would model that right no and it, and it feels differently and it's something we're not taught yeah. it's, i mean it should be a, a a subject in school right like we should learn how to speak to each other non-violently um i think the world would be yeah. more how do we communicate our needs Right. How do we communicate without blame or mm -hmm. without all of the past stuff that we're carrying attached to other experiences? How do we not bring that into this moment mm -hmm. right now? And, and to be able you know, to hear that. Is a and to be able to take it in too, to be on the receiving end without feeling attacked. You know, I feel some people when you, I, I used to be, I still kind of am working through this. When you come at me first with feelings, I immediately feel attacked. Mm -hmm. So it's the ability yeah. to also be able to receive that information without putting up the walls, right? Yeah. Well, because we often come at other people with our feelings, mm -hmm. not owning our feelings. Okay. Like we're saying, you know, you made me, right. you know, you did this and now I, now I am. And it's like, no, <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's let's great. let's own. Yeah, let's own our stuff. Cool. So if we were going to do a list of how to step into our power, it would be some kind of contemplative practice and it would be acknowledgement. Are there any others that you would recommend on this list? Mm, so let's see. Awareness, acknowledgement. Um, how to step into your power. I'm going to throw grace in there as number three. Be graceful with yourself. Give yourself permission. Uh, we've been carrying these patterns, these habits, these ways of being, these beliefs for 20, 30, 40 plus years. And we've been doing the work for two years, right. six months, <laughs> 10 years. Give yourself grace. I think sometimes we expect ourselves I'll give a perfect example. You know, for me, I might have a situation that really ticked me off. And so now I'm spinning and the mm -hmm. thoughts about the situation and just sort of replaying it. And so, you know, I could do that for an entire day and let it just really take over my day. And then maybe next time I only did it for 12 hours out of the day. And then mm -hmm. the next time I only did it for two hours, that's progress, that's grace. Mm -hmm. You know, and so sometimes we, I think, just as humans, as perfectionists, as, you know, as, as the, as the human, the people that we are, we want to, mm -hmm. we want to go from here to here. You know, I used to stew on this and now I don't, and now I'm completely <laughs> over it and it doesn't work like that. So just give yourself grace <laughs> for where you are. That's, that's a brilliant point. I think I'm going to take that one to heart because we can beat ourselves up over it especially when we don't feel like we're growing as fast as we'd want to be growing, especially if the feelings are uncomfortable um, or something we don't like about ourselves. Um, so yeah, I, I like that, that maybe tomorrow we won't do it for an entire day, just half the day. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, progress, progress. Progress, what's the book, Progress Over Perfection? I haven't read it, I just like the line. Yeah. Very true. Very <laughs> true. That's just, practice. You know, it used to be practice makes perfect. Mm. And we, we don't say that in my house. It's practice makes progress. Mm, I like that. Yeah. 
with that. Um, well, we're on, we are out of time because, but I could probably talk to you for the rest of the day. Uh, I know, same, same. I, it's really great to, to be able to be in flow with, with someone that shares the same language and understanding. Yeah, I appreciate you. Um, and I know that whomever is listening or watching is gonna want more because I do. So I have put the link in the show notes. Um, so they could get your newsletter, which is at ritajohnston.com forward slash newsletter. And there you'll also find Rita's inner circle community, um, yeah. where I believe you could down you could watch uh, videos and other trainings. Yeah, yeah. So if you subscribe to the newsletter, you have access to the community. I'm constantly updating it with free downloads. Currently, there's a 28-day journal. You have access to uh, some private videos and training and all kinds of good stuff, book list. I love to read and all kinds of good stuff back there. That's awesome. Um, so that's where you can find Miss Rita Johnston. Thank you so much for being here with me. This was great. Um, maybe we could do it again because there's so much I could, I want to talk about. <laughs> right. Well, thank you again for having me, Kristen. It's been an honor. Thank you. Um, let me just check before we go. Um, this talk um, is live for our Patreon members. Um, so if you want to join us live on the call, we're available at patreon.com forward slash wild wonder. Um, thank you so much again, Rita. Um, until next time. Bye. Bye.